Good morning. Wow, Wednesday already? Of course it is. That's why you've joined me here inside the Tier 4 studio in Morgantown, West Virginia. For the Charleston Daily Mail, I am Mike Casaza, and you are here for the Wednesday walkthrough, our weekly look ahead at West Virginia University's upcoming football game. And this will be a lot like what has already happened for West Virginia this season. Big time underdog. Probably the largest point spread that I could find since 1991. Between 27 and a half and 30 points, depending on where you would get your numbers if gambling on sports were legal. But what else isn't new is that West Virginia will be playing an undefeated ranked opponent. Four opponents ranked, four opponents undefeated. Oklahoma State was ranked, still is ranked, was undefeated, still is undefeated. Maryland was not ranked, was undefeated, still is undefeated, and is now ranked. Oklahoma State was ranked, still is ranked, is no longer undefeated. Baylor, 3-0, number 17 in the country. Haven't played much, though. This is the first game in 27 days. So, rust, skills, fundamentals, but mostly continuity. Things that you want to keep an eye on with Baylor. That operation, the timing is important for them for a team that likes to play fast and relies on skill and speed so much on offense and how that connects with the timing of the operation from the quarterback to the players getting the ball. That's probably something that can be not overlooked, I guess, when you have such a layoff like that. It's always a concern before a bowl game. Well, this is one game in a month, so this early in the season, sure, that's something that the Bears might have a problem with. The Bears offense does not have a lot of problems. Number one in scoring, number one in passing, number one in total offense, and for good reason. They have really, really good, skilled, fast, strong, mean, big players across the board. Offensive line, really, really good. Cyril Richardson, a mountainous left guard. They have two other seniors that have played a lot and some other guys who are in the third year in the program uh, starting on the offensive line. Will they run? Will they pass? That's what they like to do. Mix it up. Be balanced. Everybody knows Lake Seastrunk. Exploded last season. Final half of the year. Predicted he could win the Heisman Trophy. Fast guy. Dangerous. You're not going to catch him from behind. Well, Glasgow Martin is no less important to what Baylor does on offense, and he will be back for this game and for an indication of how much Baylor likes to use him while Seastrunk was exploding. Martin got more carries than Seastrunk over that time where Seastrunk was aiming up and taking over college football, so we thought. But Bryce Petty, new quarterback, stepped in. He's Nick Florence. Nick Florence was RG3. This is the same thing on offense. They catch the ball. They put it in play. They make plays with it. Petty has a lot of targets, and what strikes me is the the variety of the players at their variety of positions. Outside receivers, Anton Godley, 5'10", but 225. Big guy, physical, but he can move when he gets into space. On the other side is an outside receiver, Jay Lee, 6'2", 215 or so. They're backed up by Robbie Rhodes, who's six foot, you know, about 185 for a freshman, normal size, but happens to be one of the best freshman receivers in the country. Inside, Tevin Reese and Levi Norwood, really good, quick players, but they have a couple 6'2 guys behind them, and they'll use tight ends in that slot position, not unlike West Virginia. But keep an eye on what Baylor does, how they use the 53 and the third yards in between the sidelines. No one goes out wider with their receivers. They'll put their inside receivers eh, just inside the numbers. They'll put their outside receivers darn near on the sideline. Uh, the quarterback can make that throw. He can go that way, and what that does, it creates depth. The safeties have to be back further if they're going to cover that space left to right, and that creates space in the middle for the running game, and also the receivers who are going to take advantage of lanes and gaps and creases that a lot of their short throws and, and quick routes hope to develop. Defensively, though, is where Baylor is pretty interesting, much, much better than when you last saw them out in your field allowing 70 points to Obviously a much different West Virginia offensive team. Now, they have not played a lot of offenses that are very good. I think if you look at the beginning of the season, you would say, wow, Louisiana Monroe, that's a good opponent for them. But they stunk up the joint against Oklahoma and got shut out. Baylor handled Louisiana Monroe, too. So what to make of their opponents? Who knows? But Baylor's defense has thus far done the job. More touchdowns scored by the defense than allowed by the defense. And... They're settling in on some things. They mix in some 3-4 three, with their 4-2-5. They'll cover you because they have the five defensive backs, and they'll blitz. They'll bring their nickel back down, Sam Hall. He leads the team in sacks, actually. They're good across the line. Um, defensive end, Chris McAllister, is a pretty good player on the outside. He's backed up by Oakman from Penn State, a transfer. He is 6'8 and 275. He gets the pushing and slapping people. He leads the team with eight Tackles for a loss already. He's really good off the edge. West Virginia's tackles will be tested there. The corner situation for Baylor, young guys, but they've played a lot. Sophomores who have started, you know, 
a lot of games already here. Seniors who have started 20, 30 games. They can mix guys in, but they've been solid so far. And Ahmad Dixon, the safety, he was the nickelback last season. He's really solidified the back end of Baylor's defense from the spring through, again, the early stage of the season. So West Virginia, how will they match up? Well, let's stick with their offense there. The tackles have to be good. Curtis Fight, it's been okay. Uh, Nick Hitler is going to hang on to the left tackle spot. Baylor's ends, Baylor's nickelbacks, they're going to come around the corner, obviously. Tackles have to be good. Quentin Spain will probably have to slide over sometimes to help Kindler. Uh, similar situation for Mark Lewinsky at right guard. That'll be um, a challenge to see. Baylor, not a lot of pressure, but when they do it, can West Virginia turn it back? West Virginia going to keep that offensive line rotation on the shelf, probably. Just not going to move it around a whole lot. Kindler, who had been the left tackle, right tackle, he played about 80 or so of the 90 snaps the other day. He'd been playing about half the game before, so that's how the, the depth has been compressed a little bit on the offensive line as they try to settle in and, and find some quality of their continuity. Really get players at home and have them where they're comfortable and the offense can function at its most optimal level, which really hadn't happened so much before Saturday against Oklahoma State, so they'll probably try to continue that. Quarterback, who knows? Clint Trickett did practice, Paul Millard did practice, they split the reps, not 80-20, Millard, Childress, but 50-50 or so, according to Shannon Dawson. Ford Childress did not practice, so just Trickett, just Millard, not Childress, that probably means you're looking at uh, Trickett or Millard. I've been told that Trickett should be fine for the game, will that be something that you can believe the rest of the days and hours before kickoff? Who knows, hard to say because details out of there are scant and sometimes not entirely accurate. Receivers, good game last game for Jordan Thompson and some of their outside guys. How Mario Alford and how Ivan McCartney are doing, guys who left the game and did not return, don't know. Day-to-day, -day, one of those things. If they play, they play. If they don't play, well, obviously those dings were a little bit deeper uh, that were suffered against Oklahoma State. Defensively for West Virginia, Nick Kwiatkowski, excuse me, Nick Kwiatkowski uh, still has the hamstring. He's questionable. Uh, Keith Patterson thinks he'll have enough linebackers to play, but if this is the game that you don't have a lot of linebackers, not really terrible news. Granted, you want to have your best players, and Kwiatkowski had been their best linebacker, but you're not going to see a lot of true 3-4 out of West Virginia. Expect to see 3-3-5 kind of stuff, or, you know, Things where the nickelback slides down and will play a lot more than maybe the third outside linebacker, which means big games and nickel and dime coverage for K.J. Dillon, Darrell Worley, maybe even Avery Williams. But they're used to that already. They've done that a couple times. Williams has played a good bit in the last couple of games. Uh, Dillon, obviously, and Worley, obviously, have played a bunch this season in their roles. So I don't think West Virginia is maybe so hard up if their linebackers don't have the complete depth that... Keith Patterson has left far ahead this year. And the good news is their defensive line has been really good the last couple of games. That makes life easier, especially for people who are trying to cover, I don't know, 45, 50 throws, maybe even 90 plays. Quarterback's going to be spent a little bit chasing receivers down the field. That's something Baylor does. They'll just run their receivers down the field a couple times, get the cornerbacks heaving, suck in air, and then all of a sudden they'll pick on those cornerbacks and make something happen. So the defensive line, sure, has to have a good game. Be solid against the run. Try to find your ways through and around guys like Richardson, uh, don't let Seastrunk get back it, because if you see the name across his shoulders, you're in trouble. But also, um, guard that space. Probably the biggest thing for West Virginia is make sure that their safeties, Darwin Cook and Carl Joseph, can handle that space. Again, they're going to play a little bit deeper than normal, probably. Keith Patterson has liked to use them in the passing game um, as defenders. We saw them play cornerback a little bit last game, but... They're going to have to tackle them. They're going to have to ruin that space well in the secondary because, again, Baylor creates so much extra room with their splits and alignments. Special teams, though. Um, I don't know how much of a thing this is going to be. Again, when teams are off, as Baylor has been, they generally work on special teams, and you can get an edge of special teams. But you really can't practice special teams a whole lot, so it's not like the Bears spent the entirety of their breaks between games working on special teams. They really haven't been especially dynamic in those areas either. But West Virginia is taking their craft seriously, seriously this week. And what I mean by that is, believe it or not, on Sunday, um, in their very light practice, kind of a, a walk-through kind of workout between games, they had their punt returners stand on the 10-yard line and practice backing up 5, 6, 7 yards and letting the ball bounce. They're also auditioning punt returners right now, and they have a list of them, guys that you would expect, like Charles Sims, Wendell Smallwood, and Ronald Carswell, but also Jordan Thompson, Daryl Worley, and Travis Bell. Dana Holgerson said his kick returners are garbage. Some of those names you recognize as part of the garbage heap, so maybe guys like Thompson or Bell or Worley even get a chance to play. We'll know about that. We'll know about the quarterback. We'll know much more about how West Virginia will line up when we have have kickoff at 8 o'clock Saturday, and then probably know a lot more about this team 
well, probably around 1 in the morning when this game ends, but certainly um, something to pay attention to and really answer even more questions about West Virginia. You saw last week how they handled defeat after Maryland, and now I get to see how they handle success after beating Oklahoma State.